Chapter Twenty Seven of Peter Simple. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. Peter Simple by Frederick Marriott. Chapter Twenty Seven. Captain and Mrs. Two, Pork. We go to Plymouth and fall in with our old captain. I immediately took leave of my family and set off for Portsmouth and in two days arrived at the fountain inn where o'brien was waiting to receive me peter my boy i feel so much obliged to you that if your uncle won't go out of the world by fair means i'll pick a quarrel with him and shoot him on purpose that you may be a lord as i am determined that you shall be now come up into my room where we'll be all alone and i'll tell you all about the ship and our new captain in the first place we'll begin with the ship as the most important personage of the two she's a beauty i forget her name before she was taken but the french know how to build ships better than keep em she's now called the sanglia which means a wild pig and by the powers a pig ship she is as you will hear directly the captain's name is a very short one and wouldn't please mr chucks consisting only of two letters t and o which makes two his whole title is captain john too it would almost appear if somebody had broken off the better half of his name and only left him the commencement of it but however it's a handy name to sign when he pays off his ship and now i'll tell you what sort of a looking craft he is he's built like a dutch shoit great breadth of beam and very square tuck he applied to have the quarter galleries enlarged in the last two ships he commanded he weighs about eighteen stone rather more or less he is a good-natured sort of chap amazingly ungenteel not much of an officer not much of a sailor but a devilish good hand at the trencher but he's only a part of the concern he has his wife on board who is a red herring sort of a lady and very troublesome to boot what makes her still more annoying is that she has a piano on board very much out of tune on which she plays very much out of time holy stoning is music compared with her playing even the captain's spaniel howls when she comes to the high notes but she affects the fine lady and always treats the officers with music when they dine in the cabin which makes them very glad to get out of it but o'brien i thought wives were not permitted on board very true but there's the worst part in the man's character he knows that he is not allowed to take his wife to sea and in consequence he never says she is his wife or presents her on shore to anybody if any of the other captains ask how mrs two is to-day why he replies pretty well i thank you but at the same time he gives a kind of smirk as if to say she is not my wife and although everybody knows that she is yet he prefers that they should think otherwise rather than be at the expense of keeping her on shore for you know peter that although there are regulations about wives there are none with regard to other women but does his wife know this inquired i i believe from my heart that she is a party to the whole transaction for report says that she would skin a flint if she could she's always trying for presents from the officers and in fact she commands the ship really o'brien this is not a very pleasant prospect whist wait a little now i come to the wind-up this captain too is very partial to pig's meat and we have as many live pigs on board as we have pigs of ballast the first lieutenant is right mad about them at the same time he allows no pigs but his own on board that there may be no confusion the manger is full of pigs there are two cow pens between the main deck guns drawn from the dockyard and converted into pig pens the two sheep pens amidships are full of pigs and the geese and turkey coops are divided off into apartments for four sows in the family way now peter you see there's little or no expense in keeping pigs on board of a large frigate with so much pay soup and whole beans for them to eat and this is the reason why he keeps them for the devil a bit of any other stock he has on board i presume he means to milk one of the old sows for breakfast when the ship sails the first thing that he does in the morning is to go round to his pigs with the butcher feeling one scratching the dirty ears of another and then he classes them his bacon pigs his porkers his breeding sows and so on the old boar is still at the stables of this inn but i hear he is to come on board with the sailing orders 
but he is very savage and is therefore left on shore to the very last moment now really pater what with the squealing of the pigs and his wife's piano we are almost driven mad i don't know which is the worst of the two if you go aft you hear the one if you go forward you hear the other by way of variety and that i say is charming but is it not shocking that such a beautiful fit should be turned into a big sty and that her main deck should smell worse than a muck heap but how does his wife like the idea of living only upon hog's flesh she lord bless you pater why she looks as spare as a shark and she has just the appetite of one for she'll boil a four-pound piece of pork before it's well put on her plate have you any more such pleasant intelligence to communicate o'brien no pater you have the worst of it the lieutenants are good officers and pleasant messmates the doctrine's a little queer and the purser thinks himself a wag the master an old north countryman who knows his duty and takes his glass of grog the midshipmen are a very genteel set of young men and full of fun and frolic i'll bet a wager there'll be a bobbery in the pigsty before long for they are ripe for mischief now pater i hardly need to say that my cabin and everything i have is at your service and i think if we could only have a devil of a gale of wind or a hard-fought action to send the pigs overboard and smash the piano we should do very well the next day i went on board and was shown down into the cabin to report my having joined mrs two a tall thin woman was at her piano she rose and asked me several questions who my friends were how much they allowed me a year and many other questions which i thought impertinent but a captain's wife is allowed to take liberties then she asked me if i was fond of music that was a difficult question as if i said that i was i should in all probability be obliged to hear it if i said that i was not i might have created a dislike in her so i replied that i was very fond of music on shore when it was not interrupted by other noises ah then i perceive you are a real amateur mr simple replied the lady captain too then came out of the after cabin half dressed well youngster so you've joined at last come and dine with us to-day and as you go down to your berth desire the sentry to pass the word for the butcher i want to speak with him i bowed and retired i was met in the most friendly manner by the officers and by my own messmates who had been prepossessed in my favour by o'brien previous to my arrival in our service you always find young men of the best families on board large frigates they being considered the most eligible class of vessels i found my messmates to be gentlemen with one or two exceptions but i never met so many wild young lads together i sat down and ate some dinner with them although i was to dine in the cabin for the sea air made me hungry don't you dine in the cabin simple said the caterer yes replied i then don't eat any pork my boy now for you'll have plenty there come gentlemen fill your glasses we'll drink happiness to our new messmate and pledging him we pledge ourselves to try and promote it i'll just join you in that toast said o'brien walking into the midshipman's berth what is it you're drinking it in some of collier's port sir boy bring a glass for mr o'brien here's your health pater and wishing you may keep out of a french prison this cruise mr montague as caterer i beg you will order another candle that i may see what's on the table and then perhaps i may find something i should like to pick a bit off here's the fag end of a leg of mutton mr o'brien and there's a piece of boiled pork then i'll just trouble you for a bit close to the knuckle pater you dine in the cabin so do i the doctor refused have you heard when we sail mr o'brien inquired one of my messmates i heard at the admiral's office that we were expected to be ordered round to plymouth and receive our orders there either for the east or west indies they thought and indeed the stores we have taken on board indicates that we are going foreign but the captain's signal is just made and probably the admiral has intelligence to communicate in about an hour afterwards the captain returned looking very red and hot he called the first lieutenant aside from the rest of the officers who were on deck to receive him and told him that we were to start for plymouth the next morning and the admiral had told him confidentially that we were to proceed to the west indies with a convoy which was then collecting he appeared to be very much alarmed at the idea of going to make a feast for the land crabs and certainly his gross habit of body rendered him very unfit for the climate this news was soon spread through the ship and there was of course no little bustle and preparation the doctor who had refused to dine in the cabin upon plea of being unwell sent up to say that he felt himself so much better 
that he should have great pleasure in attending the summons and he joined the first lieutenant o'brien and me as we walked in we sat down to table the covers were removed and as the midshipman prophesied there was plenty of pork mock turtle soup made out of a pig's head and a boiled leg of pork and peas pudding a roast spare rib with a crackling on sausages and potatoes and pig's petitos i cannot say that i disliked my dinner and i ate very heartily but a roast sucking pig came on as a second course which rather surprised me but what surprised me more was the quantity devoured by mrs too she handed her plate from the boiled pork to the roast asked for some potatoes tried the sausages and finished with a whole plateful of sucking pig and stuffing we had an apple pie at the end but as we had already eaten apple sauce with the roast pork we did not care for it the doctor who abominated pork ate pretty well and was excessively attentive to mrs too will you not take a piece of the roast pig doctor said the captain why really captain too as we are bound by all reports to a station where we must not venture upon pork i think i will not refuse to take a piece for i am very fond of it how do you mean inquired the captain and his lady both in a breath perhaps i may be wrongly informed replied the doctor but i have heard that we were ordered to the west indies now if so every one knows that although you may eat salt pork there occasionally without danger in all tropical climates and especially the west indies two or three days living upon this meat will immediately produce dysentery which is always fatal in that climate indeed claimed the captain you don't say so rejoined the lady oh i do indeed and have always avoided the west indies for that very reason i am so fond of pork the doctor then proceeded to give nearly one hundred instances of best mates and shipmen who had been attacked with dysentery from the eating of fresh pork in the west indies and o'brien perceiving the doctor's drift had joined him telling some most astonishing accounts of the dreadful effects of pork in a hot country i think he said that when the french were blockaded previous to the surrender of martinique that having nothing but pigs to eat thirteen hundred out of the seventeen hundred soldiers and officers died in the course of three weeks and the others were so reduced by disease they were obliged to capitulate the doctor then changed the subject and talked about the yellow fever and other diseases of the climate so that by his account the west india islands were but hospitals to die in those most likely to be attacked were men in full strong health the spare men stood a better chance this conversation was carried on until it was time to leave mrs too at last quite silent and the captain gulping down his wine with a sigh when we rose from the table mrs too did not ask us as usual to stay and hear a little music she was like her piano not a little out of tune by the powers doctor you did that nately said o'brien as we left the cabin o'brien said the doctor oblige me and you mr simple oblige me also by not saying a word in the ship about what i have said if it once gets wind i shall have done no good but if you both hold your tongues for a short time i think i may promise you to get rid of captain too his wife and his pigs we perceived the justice of his observation and promised secrecy the next day the ship sailed for plymouth and mrs too sent for the doctor not being very well the doctor prescribed for her and i believe on my conscience made her worse on purpose the illness of his wife and his own fears brought captain too more than usual in contact with the doctor of whom he frequently asked his candid opinion as to his own chance in a hot country captain too said the doctor i never would have given my opinion if you had not asked for it for i am aware that as an officer you would never flinch from your duty to whatever quarter of the globe you may be ordered but as you have asked the question i must say with your full habit of body i think you would not stand a chance of living for more than two months at the same time sir i may be mistaken but at all events i must point out that mrs too is of a very bilious habit and i trust you will not do such an injustice to an amiable woman as to permit her to accompany you thank ye doctor i am much obliged to you replied the captain turning round and going down the ladder to his cabin we were then beating down the channel for although we ran through the needles with a fair wind it fell calm and shifted to the westward when we were abreast of portland the next day the captain gave an order for a very fine pig to be killed for he was out of provisions mrs too still kept her bed and he therefore directed that a part should be salted as he could have no company 
i was in the midshipman's berth when some of them proposed that we should get possession of the pig and the plan they agreed upon was as follows they were to go to the pen that night and with a needle stuck in a piece of wood to prick the pig all over and then rub gunpowder into the parts wounded this was done and although the butcher was up a dozen times during the night to ascertain what made the pig so uneasy the midshipman passed the needle from watch to watch until the pig was well tattooed in all parts in the morning watch it was killed and when it had been scalded in the tub and the hair taken off it appeared covered with blue spots the midshipman of the morning watch who was on the main deck took care to point out to the butcher that the pork was measly to which the man unwillingly assented stating at the same time that he could not imagine how it could be for a finer pig he had never put a knife into the circumstance was reported to the captain who was much astonished the doctor came in to visit mrs too and the captain requested the doctor to examine the pig and give his opinion although this was not the doctor's province yet as he had great reason for keeping intimate with the captain he immediately consented going forward he met me and i told him the secret that will do replied he it all tends to what we wish the doctor returned to the captain and said that there was no doubt but that the pig was measly which was a complaint very frequent on board ships particularly in hot climates where all pork became measly one great reason for their proving so unwholesome the captain sent for the first lieutenant and with a deep sigh ordered him to throw the pig overboard but the first lieutenant who knew what had been done from o'brien ordered the master's mate to throw it overboard the master's mate touching his hat said ay ay sir and took it down into the berth where we cut it up salted one half and the other we finished before we arrived at plymouth which was six days from the time we left portsmouth on our arrival we found part of the convoy lying there but no orders for us and to my great delight on the following day the diomede arrived from a cruise off the western islands i obtained permission to go on board with o'brien and we once more greeted our messmates mr falcon the first lieutenant went down to captain savage to say we were on board and he requested us to come into the cabin he greeted us warmly and gave us great credit for the manner in which we had effected our escape when we left the cabin i found mr chucks the boatswain waiting outside my dear mr simple extend your flapper to me for i'm delighted to see you i long to have a long talk with you and i should like it also mr chucks but i am afraid we have not time i dine with captain savage to-day and it only wants an hour of dinner-time well mr simple i've been looking at your frigate and she's a beauty much larger than the diomede and she behaves quite as well replied i i think we are two hundred tons larger you've no idea of her size until you are on her decks i should like to be boatswain of her mr simple that is with captain savage for i will not part with him i had some more conversation with mr chucks but i was obliged to attend to others who interrupted us we had a very pleasant dinner with our old captain to whom we gave a history of our adventures and then we returned on board End of chapter 27「Twenty Eight of Peter Simple. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. Peter Simple by Frederick Marriott. Chapter 28. We get rid of the pigs and pianoforte, the last boat on shore before sailing, the first lieutenant too hasty, and the consequences to me. We waited three days at the expiration of which we heard that captain too was about to exchange with captain savage we could not believe such good news to be true and we could not ascertain the truth of the report as the captain had gone on shore with mrs too who recovered fast after she was out of our doctor's hands so fast indeed that a week afterwards on questioning the steward upon his return on board how mrs too was he replied oh charmin well again sir she's eaten a whole pig since she left the ship but the report was true captain too afraid to go to the west indies had effected an exchange with captain savage captain savage was permitted as was the custom of the service to bring his first lieutenant his boatswain his barge's crew with him he joined a day or two before we sailed and never was there more joy on board the only people miserable were the first lieutenant and those belonging to the sanglier who were obliged to follow captain too who with his wife his pigs and her piano 
were all got rid of in the course of one forenoon i have already described payday on board a man-of-war but i think that the two days before sailing are even more unpleasant although generally speaking all our money being spent we are not sorry when we once are fairly out of harbour and find ourselves in blue water the men never work well in those days they are thinking of their wives and sweethearts of the pleasure they had when at liberty on shore where they might get drunk without punishment and many of them are either half drunk at the time or suffering from the effects of previous intoxication the ship is in disorder and crowded with the variety of stock and spare stores which are obliged to be taken on board in a hurry and have not yet been properly secured in their places the first lieutenant is cross the officers are grave and the poor midshipmen with all their own little comforts to attend to are harassed and drive about like post horses mr simple inquired the first lieutenant where do you come from from the gunner sir with the gunner's spare blocks and breechings very well send the marines aft to clear the boat and pipe away the first cutter mr simple jump into the first cutter and go to mount wise for the officers be careful that none of your men leave the boat come be smart now i had been away the whole morning and it was then half past one i had had no dinner but i said nothing and went into the boat as soon as i was off o'brien who stood by mr falcon said pater was thinking of his dinner poor fellow i really quite forgot it replied the first lieutenant there is so much to do he is a willing boy and he shall dine in the gun-room when he comes back and so i did so i lost nothing by not expostulating and gained more of the favour of the first lieutenant who never forgot what he called zeal but the hardest trial of the whole is to the midshipman who is sent to the boat to purchase the supplies for the cabin and gun-room on the day before the ship's sailing it was my misfortune to be ordered upon that service this time and that very unexpectedly i had been ordered to dress myself to take the gig on shore for the captain's orders and was walking the deck with my very best uniform and side-arms when the marine officer who was the gun-room caterer came up to the first lieutenant and asked him for a boat the boat was manned and a midshipman ordered to take charge of it but when he came up the first lieutenant recollecting that he had come off two days before with only half his boat's crew would not trust him and calling out to me here mr simple i must send you in this boat mind you are careful that none of the men leave it and bring off the sergeant of marines who is on shore looking for the men who have broken their liberty although i could not but feel proud of the compliment yet i did not much like going in my very best uniform and would have run down and changed it but the marine officer and all the people were in the boat and i could not keep it waiting so down the side i went and we shoved off we had besides the boat's crew the marine officer the purser the gun-room steward the captain's steward and the purser's steward so that we were pretty full it blew hard from the southeast and there was a sea running but as the tide was flowing into the harbour there was not much bubble we hoisted the foresail flew before the wind and tide and in quarter of an hour we were at mutton cove when the marine officer expressed his wish to land the landing-place was crowded with boats and it was not without sundry exchanges of foul words and oaths and bowmen dashing the points of their boat-hooks into the shore-boats to make them keep clear of us that we forced our way to the beach the marine officer and all the stewards then left the boat and i had to look after the men i had not been there three minutes before the bowman said that his wife was on the wharf with his clothes from the wash and begged leave to go and fetch them i refused telling him that she could bring them to him why no mr simple said the woman aren't you a nice lady's man to go for to ax me to mutter my way to all the dead dogs cabbage stocks and stinkin hakes heads with my brand new shoes and clean stockings i looked at her and sure enough she was as they say in france bien chaussée come mr simple let him out to come for his clothes and you'll see that he's back in a moment i did not like to refuse her and it was very dirty and wet and the shingle was strewed with all that she mentioned the bowman made a spring out with his boat-hook threw it back went up to his wife and commenced talking with her while i watched him if you please sir there's my young woman come down mayn't i speak to her said another of the men i turned round and refused him he expostulated and begged very hard but i was resolute however when i again turned my eyes to watch the bowman he and his wife were gone there says i to the coxswain i knew it would be so you see hickman is off only gone to take a part in glass sir replied the coxswain he'll be here directly i hope so but i'm afraid not 
after this i refused all the solicitations of the men to be allowed to leave the boat but i permitted them to have some beer brought down to them the gunboat steward then came back with a basket of soft tack in other words loaves of bread and told me that the marine officer requested i would allow two of the men to go up with him to glencross shop to bring down some of the stores of course i sent two of the men and told the steward if he saw hickman to bring him down to the boat by this time many of the women belonging to the ship had assembled and commenced a noisy conversation with the boat's crew one brought one article for jim another some clothes for bill some of them climbed into the boat and sat with the men others came and went bringing beer and tobacco which the men desired them to purchase the crowd the noise and confusion were so great that it was with the utmost difficulty that i could keep my eyes on all my men who one after another made an attempt to leave the boat just at that time came down the sergeant of marines with three of our men whom he had picked up roaring drunk they were tumbled into the boat and increased the difficulty as in looking after those who were riotous and would try to leave the boat by force i was not so well able to keep my eyes on those who were sober the sergeant then went up after another man and i told him also about hickman about half an hour afterwards the steward came down with the two men loaded with cabbages baskets of eggs strings of onions crockery of all descriptions paper parcels of groceries legs and shoulders of mutton which were crowded in until not only the stern sheets but all under the thwarts of the boat was also crammed full they told me that they had a few more things to bring down and that the marine officer had gone to stonehouse to see his wife so that they should be down long before him in half an hour more during which i had the greatest difficulty to manage the boat's crew they returned with a dozen geese and two ducks tied by the legs but without the two men who had given them the slip so that there were now three men gone and i knew mr falcon would be very angry for they were three of the smartest men in the ship i was now determined not to run the risk of losing more men and i ordered the boat's crew to shove off that i might lie at the wharf where they could not climb up they were very mutinous grumbled very much and would hardly obey me the fact is they had drunk a great deal and some of them were more than half tipsy however at last i was obeyed but not without being saluted with a shower of invectives from the women and the execrations of the men belonging to the wherries and shore-boats which were washed against our sides by the swell the weather had become much worse and looked very threatening i waited an hour more when the sergeant of marines came down with two more men one of whom to my great joy was hickman this made me more comfortable as i was not answerable for the other two still i was in great trouble from the riotous and insolent behaviour of the boat's crew and the other men brought down by the sergeant of marines one of them fell back into a basket of eggs and smashed them all to atoms still the marine officer did not come down and it was getting late the tide being now at the ebb running out against the wind there was a very heavy sea and i had to go off to the ship with a boat deeply laden and most of the people in her in a state of intoxication the coxswain who was the only one who was sober recommended our shoving off as it would soon be dark and some accident would happen i reflected a minute and agreeing with him i ordered the oars to be got out and we shoved off the sergeant of marines and the gun-room steward perched up in the bows drunken men ducks and geese lying together at the bottom of the boat the stern sheets loaded up to the gunwale and the other passengers and myself sitting how we could among the crockery and a variety of other articles with which the boat was crowded it was a scene of much confusion the half-drunken boat's crew catching crabs and falling forward upon the others those who were quite drunk swearing they would pull lay on your oar sullivan you were doing more harm than good you drunken rascal i'll report you as soon as we get on board oh the devil can i pull your honour when there's that fellow jones breaking the very back of me with his oars and he never touching the water all the while you lie cried jones i'm pulling the boat by myself against the hull of the larboard oars he's rowing dry your honour only make believe do you call this rowing dry cried another as the sea swept over the boat fore and aft wetting every body to the skin now your honour just look and see if i ain't pulling the very arms off of me cried sullivan is there water enough to cross the bridge swinburne said i to the coxswain plenty mr simple it is but quarter ebb and the sooner we are on board the better we were now past devil's point and the sea was very heavy the boat plunged in the trough so that i was afraid that we should break her back she was soon half full of water and the two after oars were laid in for the men to bail please your honour 
hadn't i better cut free the legs of them ducks and geese and allow them to swim for their lives cried sullivan resting on his oar the poor birds will be drowned else in their own element no no pull away as hard as you can by this time the drunken men in the bottom of the boat began to be very uneasy from the quantity of water which washed about them and made several staggering attempts to get on their legs they fell down again upon the ducks and the geese the major part of which were saved from being drowned by being suffocated the sea on the bridge was very heavy and although the tide swept us out we were nearly swamped soft bread was washing about the bottom of the boat the parcels of sugar pepper and salt were wet through with the salt water and a sudden jerk threw the captain's steward who was seated upon the gunwale close to the after oar right upon the whole of the crockery and eggs which added to the mass of destruction a few more seas shipped completed the job and the gunroom steward was in despair that's a darling cried sullivan the politest boat in the whole fleet she makes more bows and curtsies than the finest couple in the land give way my lads and work the crater stuff out of your elbows and the first lieutenant will see us all sober so wet in the bargain and thinking we're all so dry that perhaps he'll be after giving us a raw nip when we get on board in a quarter of an hour we were nearly alongside but the men pulled so badly and the sea was so great that we missed the ship and went astern they veered out a boy with a line which we got hold of and were hauled up by the marines and afterguard the boat plunging bows under and drenching us through and through at last we got under the counter and i climbed up by the stern ladder mr falcon was on deck and very angry at the boat not coming alongside properly i thought mr simple that you knew by this time how to bring a boat alongside so i do sir i hope replied i but the boat was so full of water and the men would not give way what men has the sergeant brought on board three sir replied i shivering with the cold and unhappy at my very best uniform being spoiled are all your boat's crew with you sir no sir there are two left on shore they not a word sir up to the masthead and stay there till i call you down if it were not so late i would send you on shore and not receive you on board again without the men up sir immediately i did not venture to explain but i went up it was very cold blowing hard from the southeast with heavy squalls i was so wet the wind appeared to blow through me and it was now nearly dark i reached the cross trees and when i was seated there i felt that i had done my duty and had not been fairly treated during this time the boat had been hauled up alongside to clear and a pretty clearance there was all the ducks and geese were dead the eggs and crockery all broken the grocery almost washed away in short as o'brien observed there was a very pretty general average mr falcon was still very angry who are the men missing inquired he of swinburne the coxswain as he came up by the side williams and sweetman sir two of the smartest top men i am told it really is too provoking there is not a midshipman in the ship i can trust i must work all day and get no assistance the service is really going to the devil now with the young men who are sent on board to be brought up as officers and who are above doing their duty what made you so late swinburne waiting for the marine officer who went to stonehouse to see his wife but mr simple would not wait any longer and it was getting dark and we had so many drunken men in the boat mr simple did right i wish mr harrison would stay on shore with his wife altogether it's really trifling with the service pray mr swinburne why had not you your eyes about you if mr simple was so careless how came you to allow these men to leave the boat the men were ordered up by the marine officer to bring down your stores sir and they gave the steward the slip it was no fault of mr simple's nor of mine either we laid off at the wharf for two hours before we started or we should have lost more for what can a poor lad do when he has charge of drunken men who will not obey orders and the coxswain looked up at the masthead as much as to say why is he sent there i'll take my oath sir continued swinburne that mr simple never put his foot out of the boat from the time that he went over the side until he came on board and that no young gentleman could have done his duty more strictly mr falcon looked very angry at first at the coxswain speaking so freely but said nothing he took one or two turns on the deck and then hailing the masthead desired me to come down but i could not my limbs were so cramped with the wind blowing upon my wet clothes that i could not move he bailed again i heard him but was not able to answer one of the top men then came up and perceiving my condition hailed the deck and said he believed i was dying for i could not move and that he dared not leave for fear i should fall o'brien who had been on deck all the while jumped up the rigging and was soon at the cross trees where i was 
he sent the topman down into the top for a sail block and the studding sail halyards made a whip and lowered me on deck i was immediately put into my hammock and the surgeon ordering me some hot brandy and water and plenty of blankets in a few hours i was quite restored o'brien who was at my bedside said never mind peter and don't be angry with mr falcon for he is very sorry i am not angry o'brien for mr falcon has been too kind to me not to make me forgive him for being once hasty the surgeon came to my hammock gave me some more hot drink desired me to go to sleep and i woke the next morning quite well when i came into the berth my messmates asked me how i was and many of them railed against the tyranny of mr falcon but i took his part saying that he was hasty in this instance perhaps but that generally speaking he was an excellent and very just officer some agreed with me but others did not one of them who was always in disgrace sneered at me and said peter reads the bible and knows that if you smite one cheek he must offer the other now i'll answer for it if i pull his right ear he will offer me his left so saying he lugged me by the ear upon which i knocked him down for his trouble the berth was then cleared away for a fight and in a quarter of an hour my opponent gave in but i suffered a little and had a very black eye i had hardly time to wash myself and change my shirt which was bloody when i was summoned on the quarter-deck i arrived i found mr falcon walking up and down he looked very hard at me but did not ask me any questions as to the cause of my unusual appearance mr simple said he i sent for you to beg your pardon for my behaviour to you last night which was not only very hasty but very unjust i find that you were not to blame for the loss of the men i felt very sorry for him when i heard him speak so handsomely and to make his mind more easy i told him that although i certainly was not to blame for the loss of those two men still i had done wrong in permitting hickman to leave the boat and that had not the sergeant picked him up i should have come off without him and therefore i did deserve the punishment which i had received mr simple replied mr falcon i respect you and admire your feelings still i was to blame and it is my duty to apologize now go down below i would have requested the pleasure of your company to dinner but i perceive that something else has occurred which under any other circumstances i would have inquired into but at present i shall not i touched my hat and went below in the meantime o'brien had been made acquainted with the occasion of the quarrel which he did not fail to explain to mr falcon who o'brien declared was not the least bit in the world angry with me for what had occurred indeed after that mr falcon always treated me with the greatest kindness and employed me on every duty which he considered of consequence he was a sincere friend for he did not allow me to neglect my duty but at the same time treated me with consideration and confidence the marine officer came on board very angry at being left behind and talked about a court-martial on me for disrespect and neglect of stores entrusted to my charge but o'brien told me not to mind him or what he said it's my opinion peter that the gentleman has eaten no small quantity of flapdoodle in his lifetime what's that o'brien replied i i've never heard of it why peter rejoined he it's the stuff they feed fools on end of chapter twenty eight chapter twenty nine of peter simple this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state peter simple by frederick marriott chapter twenty nine a long conversation with mr chucks the advantages of having a prayer book in your pocket we run down the trades swinburne the quartermaster and his yarns the captain falls sick the next day the captain came on board with sealed orders with directions not to open them until off ushant in the afternoon we weighed and made sail it was a fine northerly wind and the bay of biscay was smooth we bore up set all the studding sails and ran along at the rate of eleven miles an hour as i could not appear on the quarter-deck i was put down on the sick list captain savage who was very particular asked what was the matter with me the surgeon replied an inflamed eye the captain asked no more questions and i took care to keep out of his way i walked in the evening on the forecastle when i renewed my intimacy with mr chucks the boatswain to whom i gave a full narrative of all my adventures in france i have been ruminatin mr simple said he how such a stripling as you could have gone through so much fatigue and now i know how it is it is blood mr simple all blood you are descended from good blood and there's as much difference between nobility and the lower classes as there is between a racer and a cart-horse 
i cannot agree with you mr chucks common people are quite as brave as those who are well born you do not mean to say that you are not brave that the seamen on board the ship are not brave no no mr simple but as i observed about myself my mother was a woman who could not be trusted and there is no saying who was my father she was a very pretty woman to boot which levels all distinctions for the moment as for the seamen god knows i should do them an injustice if i did not acknowledge that they were as brave as lions but there are two kinds of bravery mr simple the bravery of the moment and the courage of bearing up for a long while do you understand me i think i do but still do not agree with you who will bear more fatigue than our sailors yes yes mr simple that is because they are endured to it from their hard life but if the common sailors were all such little thread papers as you and had been brought up so carefully they would not have gone through all you have that's my opinion mr simple there's nothing like blood i think mr chucks you carry your ideas on that subject too far i do not mr simple and i think moreover that he who has more to lose than another will always strive more but a common man only fights for his own credit but when a man is descended from a long line of people famous in history and has a coat in arms criss-crossed and stuck all over with lions and unicorns to support the dignity of why has he not to fight for the credit of all his ancestors whose names would be disgraced if he didn't behave well i agree with you mr chucks in the latter remark to a certain extent mr simple we never know the value of good descent when we have it but it's when we cannot get it that we can appreciate it i wish i had been born a nobleman i do by heavens and mr chucks slapped his fist against the funnel so as to make it ring again well mr simple he continued after a pause it is however a great comfort to me that i have parted company with that fool mr muddle with his twenty-six thousand and odd years and that old woman dispart the gunner huh, you don't know how those two men used to fret me it was very silly but i couldn't help it now the warrant officers of this ship appear to be very respectable quiet men who know their duty and attend to it and are not too familiar which i hate and detest you went home mr simple to your friends of course when you arrived in england i did mr chucks and spent some days with my grandfather lord privilege whom you say you met at dinner well and how was the old gentleman inquired the boatswain with a sigh very well considering his age now do pray mr simple tell me all about it from the time that the servants met you at the door until you went away describe to me the house and all the rooms for i like to hear of all these things although i can never see them again to please mr chucks i entered into a full detail which he listened to very attentively until it was late and then with difficulty would he permit me to leave off and go down to my hammock the next day rather a singular circumstance occurred one of the midshipmen was mastheaded by the second lieutenant for not waiting on deck until he was relieved he was down below when he was sent for and expecting to be punished from what the headmaster told him he thrust the first book into his jacket pocket which he could lay his hand on to amuse himself at the masthead and then ran on deck as he surmised he was immediately ordered aloft he had not been there more than five minutes when a sudden squall carried away the main topgallant mast and away he went flying over to leeward for the wind had shifted and the yards were now braced up had he gone overboard as he could not swim he would in all probability have been drowned but the book in his pocket brought him up in the jaws of the forebrace block where he hung until taken out by the main topman now it so happened that it was a prayer book which he had laid hold of in his hurry and those who were superstitious declared it was all owing to his having taken a religious book with him i did not think so as any other book would have answered the purpose quite as well still the midshipman himself thought so and it was productive of good as he was a sad scamp and behaved much better afterwards but i had nearly forgotten to mention a circumstance which occurred on the day of our sailing which will be eventually found to have had a great influence upon my afterlife it was this i received a letter from my father evidently written in great vexation and annoyance informing me that my uncle whose wife i have already mentioned had two daughters and was again expected to be confined had suddenly broke up his housekeeping discharged every servant and proceeded to ireland under an assumed name no reason had been given for this unaccountable proceeding and not even my grandfather or any of the members of the family had had notice of his intention indeed 
it was by mere accident that his departure was discovered about a fortnight after it had taken place my father had taken a great deal of pains to find out where he was residing but although my uncle was traced to cork from that town all clue was lost but still it was supposed from inquiries that he was not very far from thence now observed my father in his letter i cannot help surmising that my brother in his anxiety to retain the advantages of a title to his own family has resolved to produce to the world a spurious child as his own by some contrivance or another his wife's health is very bad and she is not likely to have a large family should the one now expected prove a daughter there is little chance of his ever having another and i have no hesitation in declaring it my conviction that the measure has been taken with a view of defrauding you of your chance of eventually being called to the house of lords i showed this letter to o'brien who after reading it over two or three times gave his opinion that my father was right in his conjectures depend upon it pater there's foul play intended that is if foul play is rendered necessary but o'brien i cannot imagine why if my uncle has no son of his own he should prefer acknowledging his son of any other persons instead of his nephew but i can pater your uncle is not a man likely to live very long as you know the doctor says that with his short neck his life is not worth two years purchase now if he had a son consider that his daughters would be much better off and much more likely to get married besides there are many reasons which i won't talk about now because it's no use making you think your uncle is a scoundrel but i tell you what i'll do i'll go down to my cabin directly and write to father mcgrath telling him the whole affair and desiring him to ferret him out and watch him narrowly and i'll bet you a dozen of claret that in less than a week he'll find him out and will dog him to the last he'll get hold of his irish servants and you little know the power that a priest has in our country now give the description as well as you can of your uncle's appearance also that of his wife and the number of their family and their ages father mcgrath must have all particulars and then let him alone for doing what is needful i complied with o'brien's directions as well as i could and he wrote a very long letter to father mcgrath which was sent on shore by a careful hand i answered my father's letter and then thought no more about the matter our sealed orders were opened and proved our destination to be the west indies as we expected we touched at madeira to take in some wine for the ship's company but as we only remained one day we were not permitted to go on shore fortunate indeed would it have been if we had never gone there for the day after our captain who had dined with the consul was taken alarmingly ill from the symptoms the surgeon dreaded that he had been poisoned by something which he had eaten and which most probably had been cooked in a copper vessel not properly tinned we were all very anxious that he should recover but on the contrary he appeared to grow worse and worse every day wasting away and dying as they say by inches at last he was put in his cot and never rose from it again this melancholy circumstance added to the knowledge that we were proceeding to an unhealthy climate caused a gloom throughout the ship and although the trade wind carried us along bounding over the bright blue sea although the weather was now warm yet not too warm although the sun rose in splendour and all was beautiful and cheering the state of the captain's health was a check to all mirth every one trod the deck softly and spoke in a low voice that he might not be disturbed all were anxious to have the morning report of the surgeon and our conversation was generally upon the sickly climate the yellow fever of death and the palisades where they buried us swinburne the quartermaster was in my watch and as he had been long in the west indies i used to obtain all the information from him that i could the old fellow had a secret pleasure in frightening me as much as he could really mr simple you ask so many questions he would say as i accosted him while he was at his station at the con i wish you wouldn't ask so many questions and make yourself uncomfortable steady so steady it is with regard to yellow jack as we calls the yellow fever it's a devil incarnate that's certain you're well and able to take your allowance in the morning and dead as a herring for night first comes a bit of a headache you goes to the doctor who bleeds you like a pig then you go out of your senses then up comes the black vomit and then it's all over with you and you go to the land crabs who pick your bones as clean and as white as a sea elephant's tooth but there be one thing to be said in favour of yellow jack after all you die straight like a gentleman not cribbed up like a snowfish chucked out on the ice of the river st lawrence 
with your knees up to your nose or your toes stuck in your armpits as does take place in some of your foreign complaints but straight quite straight and limber like a gentleman still jack is a little mischievous that's certain in the year dizzy we had as fine a ship's company as was ever piped aloft steady starboard my man you're half a pint off your course we dropped our anchor in port royal and we thought that there was mischief brewing for thirty-eight sharks followed the ship into the harbour and played about us day and night i used to watch them during the night watch as their fins above water skimmed along leaving a trail of light behind them and the second night i said to the sentry abaft as i was looking at them smelling under the counter soldier says i them sharks are mustering under the orders of yellow jack and i no sooner mentioned yellow jack than the sharks gave a frisky plunge every one of them as much as to say yes so we are damn your eyes the soldier was so frightened that he would have fallen overboard if i hadn't caught him by the scruff of the neck for he was standing on the top of the taffrail as it was he dropped his musket over the stern which the sharks dashed at from every quarter making the sea look like fire and he had it charged to his wages one pound fifteen shillings i think however the fate of his musket gave him an idea of what would have happened to him if he had fallen instead of it and he never got on the taffrail again steady port mind your helm smith you can listen to my yarn all the same well mr simple yellow jack came sure enough first the purser was called to account for all his roguery we didn't care much about the land grabs eating him who made so many poor dead men chew tobacco cheating their wives and relations or greenwich hospital as it might happen then went two of the middies just about your age mr simple they poor fellows went off in a sad hurry then went the master and so it went on till at last we had no more nor sixty men left in the ship the captain died last and then yellow jack had filled his maw and left the rest of us alone as soon as the captain died all the sharks left the ship and we never saw any more of them such were the yarns told to me and the other midshipmen during the night watches and i can assure the reader that they gave us no small alarm every day that we worked our day's work and found ourselves so much nearer to the islands did we feel as if we were so much nearer to our graves i once spoke to o'brien about it and he laughed Peter says he fear kills more people than the yellow fever or any other complaint to the west indies swinburne is an old rogue and only laughing at you the devil's not half so black as he's painted nor the yellow fever half so yellow i presume we were now fast near in the island of barbados the weather was beautiful the wind always fair the flying fish rose in shoals startled by the foaming seas which rolled away and roared from the bows as our swift frigate cleaved through the water the porpoises played about us in thousands the bonitas and dolphins at one time chased the flying fish and at others appeared to be delighted in keeping company with the rapid vessel everything was beautiful and we all should have been happy had it not been for the state of captain savage in the first place who daily became worse and worse and from the dread of the hell which we were about to enter through such a watery paradise mr falcon who was in command was grave and thoughtful he appeared indeed to be quite miserable at the chance which would ensure his own promotion in every attention and every care that could be taken to ensure quiet and afford relief to the captain he was unremitting the offence of making a noise was now with him a greater crime than drunkenness or even mutiny when within three days sail of barbados it fell almost calm and the captain became much worse and now for the first time did we behold the great white shark of the atlantic there are several kinds of sharks but the most dangerous are the great white shark and the ground shark the former grows to an enormous length the latter is seldom very long not more than twelve feet but spreads to a great breadth we could not hook the sharks as they played around us for mr falcon would not permit it lest the noise of hauling them on board should disturb the captain a breeze again sprang up in two days we were close to the island and the men were desired to look out for the land End of chapter 29chapter thirty of peter simple this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state peter simple by frederick marriott chapter thirty 
death of captain savage his funeral specimen of true barbadian born sucking the monkey effects of a hurricane the next morning having hove to part of the night land was discovered on the bow and was reported by the masthead man in the same moment that the surgeon came up and announced the death of our noble captain although it had been expected for the last two or three days the intelligence created a heavy gloom throughout the ship the men worked in silence and spoke to one another in whispers mr falcon was deeply affected and so were we all in the course of the morning we ran into the island and unhappy as i was i never can forget the sensation of admiration which i felt on closing with needham point to enter carlisle bay the beach of such a pure dazzling white backed by the tall green coconut trees waving their spreading heads to the fresh breeze the dark blue of the sky and the deeper blue of the transparent sea occasionally varied into green as we passed by the coral rocks which threw their branches out from the bottom the town opening to our view by degrees houses after houses so neat with their green jalousies dotting the landscape the fort with the colours flying troops of officers riding down a busy population of all colours relieved by the whiteness of their dress altogether the scene realised my first ideas of fairyland for i thought i had never witnessed anything so beautiful and can this be such a dreadful place as it is described thought i the sails were clewed up the anchor was dropped to the bottom and a salute from the ship was answered by the forts adding to the effect of the scene the sails were furled the boats lowered down the boatswain squared the yards from the jolly boat ahead mr falcon dressed and his boat being manned went on shore with the despatches then as soon as the work was over a new scene of delight presented itself to the sight of midshipmen who had been so long upon his majesty's allowance these were the boats which crowded round the ship loaded with baskets of bananas oranges shaddocks soursops and every other kind of tropical fruit fried flying fish eggs fowls milk and everything which could tempt a poor boy after a long sea voyage the watch being called down we all hastened into the boats and returned loaded with treasures which we soon contrived to make disappear after stowing away as much fruit as would have sufficed for a dessert to a dinner given to twenty people in england i returned on deck there was no other man-of-war in the bay but my attention was directed to a beautiful little vessel a schooner whose fairy form contrasted strongly with the west india trader which lay close to her all of a sudden as i was looking at her beautiful outline a yell rose from her which quite startled me and immediately afterwards her deck was covered with nearly two hundred naked figures with woolly heads chattering and grinning at each other she was a spanish slaver which had been captured and had arrived the evening before the slaves were still on board waiting the orders of the governor they had been on deck about ten minutes when three or four men with large panama straw hats on their heads and long rattans in their hands jumped upon the gunwale and in a few seconds drove them all down below i then turned round and observed a black woman who had just climbed up the side of the frigate o'brien was on deck and she walked up to him in the most consequential manner how do you do sir very happy you come back again said she to o'brien i'm very well thank you ma'am replied o'brien and i hope to go back the same but never having put my foot into this bay before you have the advantage of me never here before so help me god me think i know you me think i recollect your handsome face i lady rodney sir ah piccinini bucra how you do said she turning round to me me hope to have the honour to wash for you sir curtsying to o'brien what do you charge in this place all the same price one bit a piece what do you call a bit inquired i a bit lily massa what you call um bit dem four shop seems to pickerine our deck was now enlivened by several army officers besides gentlemen residents who came off to hear the news invitations to the mess and to the houses of the gentlemen followed and as they departed mr falcon returned on board he told o'brien and the other officers that the admiral and squadron were expected in a few days and that we were to remain in carlisle bay and refit immediately but although the fright about the yellow fever had considerably subsided in our breasts the remembrance that our poor captain was lying dead in the cabin was constantly obtruding all that night the carpenters were up making his coffin for he was to be buried the next day the body is never allowed to remain many hours unburied in the tropical climates where putrefaction is so rapid the following morning the men were up at daylight washing the decks and putting the ship in order they worked willingly 
and yet with a silent decorum which showed what their feelings were. Never were the decks better cleaned, never were the ropes more carefully flemished down. The hammocks were stowed in their white cloths, the yards carefully squared, and the ropes hauled taut. At eight o'clock the colours and pennant were hoisted half-mast high. The men were then ordered down to breakfast and to clean themselves. During the time that the men were at breakfast, all the officers went into the cabin to take a last farewell look at our gallant captain. He appeared to have died without pain, and there was a beautiful tranquillity in his face. But even already a change had taken place, and we perceived the necessity of his being buried so soon. We saw him placed in his coffin, and then quitted the cabin without speaking to each other. When the coffin was nailed down, it was brought up by the barge's crew to the quarter-deck, and laid upon the gratings amidship, covered over with the Union Jack. The men came up from below without waiting for the pipe, and a solemnity appeared to pervade every motion. Order and quiet were universal, out of respect to the deceased. When the boats were ordered to be manned, the men almost appeared to steal into them. The barge received the coffin, which was placed in the stern sheets. The other boats then hauled up and received the officers, marines, and sailors, who were to follow the procession. When all was ready, the barge was shoved off by the bowmen. The crew dropped their oars into the water without a splash, and pulled the minute stroke. The other boats followed, and as soon as they were clear of the ship, the minute guns boomed along the smooth surface of the bay from the opposite side of the ship, while the yards were topped to starboard and to port. The ropes were slackened and hung in bites, so as to give the idea of distress and neglect. At the same time, a dozen or more of the men who had been ready dropped over the sides of the ship in different parts, and with their cans of paint and brushes in a few minutes, they faced the whole of the broad white riband which marked the beautiful run of the frigate and left her all black and in deep mourning. The guns from the forts now responded to our own. The merchant ships lowered their colors, and the men stood up respectfully with their hats off, as the procession moved slowly to the landing place. The coffin was borne to the burial ground by the crew of the barge, followed by Mr. Falcon as chief mourner. All the officers of the ship who could be spared, one hundred of the seamen walking two and two, and the marines with their arms reversed. The cortege was joined by the army officers, while the troops lined the streets, and the bands played the dead march. The service was read, the volleys were fired over the grave, and with oppressed feelings we returned to the boats and pulled on board. It then appeared to me, and to a certain degree I was correct, that as soon as we had paid our last respects to his remains, we had also forgotten our grief. The yards were again squared, the ropes hauled taut, working dresses resumed, and all was activity and bustle. The fact is that sailors and soldiers have no time for lamentation, and running as they do from climb to climb, so does scene follow scene in the same variety and quickness. In a day or two the captain appeared to be, although he was not, forgotten. Our first business was to water the ship by rafting and towing off the casks. I was in charge of the boat again, with Swinburne as coxswain. As we pulled in, there were a number of negroes bathing in the surf, bobbing their woolly heads under it as it rolled into the beach. No, Mr. Simple, said Swinburne, see how I'll make them niggers scamper. He then stood up in the stern sheets, and pointing with his finger, roared out, A shark! A shark! for the beach, puffing and blowing from their dreaded enemy, nor did they stop to look for him until they were high and dry out of his reach. Then, when we all laughed, they called us all the hangman thieves, and every other opprobrious name which they could select from the vocabulary. I was very much amused with this scene, and as much afterwards with the negroes who crowded round us when we landed. They appeared such merry fellows, always laughing, chattering, singing, and showing their white teeth. One fellow danced round us, snapping his fingers and singing songs without beginning her in. Eh, hey, massa, what you say now? Me no slave, true Barbadian born, sir, eh? Never see the day that Rodney ran away, never see him night that Rodney cannot fight. Massa me free man, sa. Suppose you give me pickery drink, massa health. Never see the day, boy, pompey look em do see, sa. And you never see the day that the grasshopper run on de Warrington. Out of the way, you nigger, cried one of the men who was rolling down a cask. Eh, hey, who you call nigger? Me free man, a true Barbadian born. Go along, you man of war man. Man o' war bukra, man o' war bukra, he de boy for me. Soldier bukra, soldier bukra, never never do, never never do for me. Soldier give one shilling, sailor give me two. Massa, now suppose you give me only one pickery now. You really handsome young gentleman. Now just walk off, said Swinburne, lifting up a stick he found on the beach. Eh, walk off. Never see the day, boy. Badian run away, boy. 
go to your work sir why you talk to me go work sir i free men and real barbadian born negro on the shore see the ship come in the brooker come on shore with the hand up to the chin man o war bukra man o war bukra he the boy for me man o war bukra man o war bukra give pickering to me at this moment my attention was directed to another negro who lay on the beach rolling and foaming at the mouth apparently in a fit what's the matter with that fellow said i to the same negro who continued close to me notwithstanding swinburne's stick hey call him sam slack massa he ab um tick tick fit and such was apparently the case stop me cure him and he snatched the stick out of swinburne's hand and running up to the man who continued to roll on the beach commenced belabouring him without mercy is some bull cried he at last quite out of breath you know better yet try again he recommenced until at last the man got up and ran away as fast as he could now whether the man was shamming or whether it was a real tick tick or epileptic fit i know not but i never heard of such a cure for it before i threw the fellow half a pickerine as much for the amusement he had offered me as to get rid of him thank you massa now man o' war man hid the tick for you again to keep off all the dumb niggas so saying he handed the stick to swinburne made a polite bow and departed we were however soon surrounded by others particularly some dingy ladies with baskets of fruit and who as they said sell ebbetain i perceived that my sailors were very fond of coconut milk which being a harmless beverage i did not object to their purchasing from these ladies who had chiefly coconuts in their baskets as i had never tasted it i asked them what it was and bought a coconut i selected the largest no massa that not go for you better one for bukra officer i then selected another but the same objection was made no massa dis very fine milk very good for de tummy i drank off the milk from the holes in the top of the coconut and found it very refreshing as for the sailors they appeared very fond of it indeed but i very soon found out that if good for de tummy it was not very good for the head as my men instead of rolling the cask began to roll themselves in all directions and when it was time to go off to dinner most of them were dead drunk at the bottom of the boat they insisted that it was the sun which affected them very hot it certainly was and i believed them at first when they were only giddy but i was convinced to the contrary when i found that they became insensible yet how they had procured the liquor was to me a mystery when i came on board mr falcon who although acting captain continued his duties as first lieutenant almost as punctually as before asked how it was that i had allowed my men to get so tipsy i assured him that i could not tell that i had never allowed one to leave the watering-place or to buy any liquor the only thing that they had had to drink was a little coconut milk which as it was so very hot i thought there could be no objection to mr falcon smiled and said mr simple i'm an old stager in the west indies and i'll let you into a secret do you know what sucking the monkey means no sir well then i'll tell you it is a term used among seamen for drinking rum out of coconuts the milk having been poured out and the liquor substituted now do you comprehend why your men are tipsy i stared with all my eyes for it never would have entered into my head and i then perceived why it was that the black woman would not give me the first coconuts which i selected i told mr falcon of this circumstance who replied well it was not your fault only you must not forget it another time it was my first watch that night and swinburne was quartermaster on deck swinburne said i you have often been in the indies before why did you not tell me that the men were sucking the monkey when i thought that they were only drinking coconut milk swinburne chuckled and answered why mr simple do you see it didn't become me as a shipmate to peach but it's seldom that a poor fellow has an opportunity of making himself a little happy and it would not be fair to take away the chance i suppose you'll never let them have coconut milk again no that i will not but i cannot imagine what pleasure they can find in getting so tipsy it's merely because they are not allowed to be so sir that's the whole story in a few words i think i could cure them if i were permitted to try i should like to hear how you'd manage that mr simple why i would oblige a man to drink off half a pint of liquor and then put him by himself i would not allow him companions to make merry with so as to make a pleasure of intoxication i would then wait until next morning when he was sober and leave him alone with a racking headache until the evening when i would give him another dose and so on forcing him to get drunk until he hated the smell of liquor well mr simple it might do with some but many of our chaps would require the dose you mentioned to be repeated pretty often before it would effect a cure what's more they'd be very willing patients and make no wry faces at their physic 
well that may be but it would cure them at last but tell me swinburne were you ever in a hurricane i've been in everything mr simple i believe except a school and i never had no time to go there did you see that battery at needham point well in the hurricane of eighty two them same guns were whirled away by the wind right over to this point here on the opposite side the sentries in their sentry boxes after them some of the soldiers who faced the wind had their teeth blown down their throats like broken backy pipes and others had their heads turned round like dog veins cause they waited for orders to the right about face and the whole air was full of young niggers blowing about like peelings of ingons you don't suppose i'd believe all this swinburne that's as may be mr simple but i've told the story so often that i believe it myself what ship were you in in the blanche captain faulkner who was as fine a fellow as poor captain savage whom we buried yesterday there could not be a finer than either of them i was at the taking of the peak and carried him down below after he had received his mortal wound we did a pretty thing out there and we took fort royal by a coup de main which means boarding from the main yard of the frigate and dropping from it into the fort but what's that under the moon that a sail in the offing swinburne fetched the glass and directed it to the spot one two three four it's the admiral sir on the squadron hove to for the night one's a line of battleship i'll swear i examined the vessels and agreeing with swinburne reported them to mr falcon my watch was then over and as soon as i was released i went to my hammock End of chapter thirty chapter thirty one of peter simple this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state peter simple by frederick marriott chapter thirty one captain kearney the dignity ball the next morning at daylight we exchanged numbers and saluted the flag and by eight o'clock they all anchored mr falcon went on board the admiral's ship with despatches and to report the death of captain savage in about half an hour he returned and we were glad to perceive with a smile upon his face from which we argued that he would receive his acting order as commander which was a question of some doubt as the admiral had the power to give the vacancy to whom he pleased although it would not have been fair if he had not given it to mr falcon not that mr falcon would not have received his commission as captain savage dying when the ship was under no admiral's command he made himself but still the admiral might have sent him home and not have given him a ship but this he did the captain of the minerva being appointed to the sanglier the captain of the possum to the minerva and captain falcon taking command of the possum he received his commission that evening and the next day the exchanges were made captain falcon would have taken me with him and offered to do so but i could not leave o'brien so i preferred remaining in the sanglier we were all anxious to know what sort of a person our new captain was whose name was kearney but we had no time to ask the midshipmen except when they came in charge of the boats which brought his luggage they replied generally that he was a very good sort of fellow and there was no harm in him but when i had the night watch with swinburne he came up to me and said well mr shimple we have a new captain i sailed with him for two years in a brig and pray swinburne what sort of person is he why i'll tell you mr shimple he's a good-tempered kind fellow enough but but what but such a bouncer how do you mean he's not a very stout man bless you mr shimple why you don't understand english i mean that he's the greatest liar that ever walked a deck now mr shimple you know i can spin a yarn occasionally yes that you can witness the hurricane the other night well mr shimple i cannot hold a candle to him it ain't that i might not stretch now and again just for fun as far as he can but damn it he's always on the stretch in fact mr shimple he never tells the truth except by mistake he's as poor as a rat and has nothing but his pay yet to believe him he is worth at least as much as greenwich hospital but you'll soon find him out and he'll serve to laugh at behind his back you know mr shimple for that's no go before his face captain kearney made his appearance on board the next day the men were mustered to receive him and all the officers were on the quarter-deck you've a fine set of marines here captain falcon observed he those i left on board on the minerva were only fit to be hung and you have a good show of reefers too those i left at the minerva were not worth hanging if you please i'll read my commission if you'll order the men aft 
his commission was read all hands with their hats off from respect to the authority from which it proceeded now my lads said captain kearney addressing the ship's company i've but a few words to say to you i am appointed to command this ship and you appear to have a very good character from your late first lieutenant all i request of you is this be smart keep sober and always tell the truth that's enough pipe down gentlemen continued he addressing the officers i trust that we shall be good friends i see no reason that it should be otherwise he then turned away with a bow and called his coxswain william you'll go on board and tell my steward that i have promised to dine with the governor to-day and that he must come to dress me and coxswain recollect to put the sheepskin mat on the stern gratings of my gig not the one i used to have when i was on shore in my carriage but the blue one which was used for the chariot you know which i mean i happened to look swinburne in the face who cocked his eye at me as much as to say there he goes we afterwards met the officers of the minerva who corroborated all that swinburne had said although it was quite unnecessary as we had the captain's own words every minute to satisfy us of the fact dinner parties were now very numerous and the hospitality of the island is but too well known the invitations extended to the midshipmen and many was the good dinner and kind reception which i had during my stay there was however one thing i had heard so much of that i was anxious to witness it which was a dignity ball but i must enter a little into explanation or my readers will not understand me the coloured peoples of barbados for reasons best known to themselves are immoderately proud and look upon all the negroes who are born on other islands as niggers they have also an extraordinary idea of their own bravery although i never heard that it has ever been put to the proof the free barbadians are most of them very rich and hold up their heads as they walk with an air quite ridiculous they ape the manners of the europeans at the same time that they appear to consider them as almost their inferiors now a dignity ball is a ball given by the most consequential of their coloured people and from the amusement and various other reasons is generally well attended by the officers both on shore and afloat the price of tickets of admission was high i think they were a joe or eight dollars each the governor sent out cards for a grand ball and supper for the ensuing week and miss betsy austin a quadroon woman ascertaining the fact sent out her cards for the same evening this was not altogether in rivalry but for another reason which was that she was aware that most of the officers and midshipmen of the ships would obtain permission to go to the governor's ball and preferring hers would slip away and join the party by which means she ensured a full attendance on the day of invitation our captain came on board and told our new first lieutenant of whom i shall say more hereafter that the governor insisted that all his officers should go that he would take no denial and therefore he presumed they must go the fact was that the governor was a relation of his wife and under some trifling obligations to him in obtaining for him his present command he certainly had spoken to the prime minister and he thought it not impossible considering the intimate terms which the minister and he had been on from childhood that his solicitation might have some effect at all events it was pleasant to find that there was some little gratitude left in this world after this of course every officer went with the exception of the master who said that he'd as soon have two round turns in his haws as go to see people kick their legs about like fools and that he'd take care of the ship the governor's ball was very splendid but the ladies were rather sallow from the effects of the climate however there were exceptions and on the whole it was a very gay affair but we were all anxious to go to the dignity ball of miss betsy austin i slipped away with three other midshipmen and we soon arrived there a crowd of negroes were outside the house but the ball had not yet commenced from want of gentlemen the ball being very correct nothing under mulatto in colour being admitted perhaps i ought to say here that the progeny of a white and a negro is a mulatto or half and half of a white and a mulatto a quadroon or one quarter black and of this class the company were chiefly composed i believe a quadroon and white make the musty or one eighth black and the musty and white the mustafina or one sixteenth black after that they are whitewashed and considered as europeans the pride of colour is very great in the west indies and they have as many quarterings as a german prince in his coat of arms a quadroon looks down upon a mulatto while a mulatto looks down upon a sambo that is half mulatto half negro while a sambo in his turn looks down upon a nigger the quadroons are certainly the handsomest race of the whole some of the women are really beautiful their hair is long and perfectly straight their eyes large and black their figures perfection and you can see the colour mantle in their cheeks quite as plainly 
and with as much effect as in those of a european we found the door of miss austin's house open and ornamented with orange branches and on our presenting ourselves were accosted by a mulatto gentleman who was we presumed usher of the black rod his head was well powdered he was dressed in white jean trousers a waistcoat not six inches long and a half-worn post-captain's coat on as a livery with a low bow he took the liberty to trouble the gentleman for the card for the ball which being produced we were ushered on by him to the ballroom at the door of which miss austin was waiting to receive her company she made us a low curtsey observing she really happy to see the gentlemen of the ship but hoped to see the officers also at her dignity this remark touched our dignity and one of my companions replied that we midshipmen considered ourselves officers and no small ones either and that if she waited for the lieutenants she must wait until they were tired of the governor's ball we having given the preference to hers this remark set all to rights sangaree was handed about and i looked around at the company i must acknowledge at the risk of losing the good opinion of my fair countrywomen that i never saw before so many pretty figures and faces the officers not having yet arrived we received all the attention and i was successfully presented to miss eurydice miss minerva miss sylvia miss aspasia miss euterpe and many other evidently borrowed from the different men-of-war which had been on the station all these young ladies gave themselves all the airs of almacs their dresses i cannot pretend to describe jewels of value were not wanting but their drapery was slight they appeared neither to wear nor to require stays and on the whole their figures were so perfect that they could only be ill-dressed by having on too much dress a few more midshipmen and some lieutenants o'brien among the number having made their appearance miss austin directed that the ball should commence i requested the honour of miss eurydice's hand in a cotillion which was to open the ball at this moment stepped forth the premier violin master of the ceremonies and ballet master massa johnson really a very smart man who gave lessons in dancing to all the badian ladies he was a dark quadroon his hair slightly powdered dressed in a light blue coat thrown well back to show his lily-white waistcoat only one button of which he could afford to button to make full room for the pride of his heart the frill of his shirt which really was an unjabat superb four inches wide and extending from his collar to the waistband of his nankeen tights which were finished off at his knees with huge bunches of ribbon his legs were encased in silk stockings which however was not very good taste on his part as they showed the manifest advantage which an european has over a coloured man in the formation of the leg instead of being straight his shins curved like a cheese knife and moreover his leg was planted into his foot like the handle into a broom or scrubbing brush there being quite as much of the foot on the heel side as on the toe side such was the appearance of mr apollo johnson whom the ladies considered as the ne plus ultra of fashion and the arbiter of elegantarium his botic or fiddlestick was his wand whose magic rap on the fiddle produced immediate obedience to his mandates ladies and gentle take your seats all started up miss eurydice you open the ball miss eurydice had but a sorry partner but she undertook to instruct me o'brien was our vis-a-vis -vis with miss euterpe the other gentlemen were officers from the ship and we stood up twelve checkered brown and white like a chessboard all eyes were fixed upon mr apollo johnson who first looked at the couples then at his fiddle and lastly at the other musicians to see if all was right and then with a wave of his botic the music began massa lieutenant cried apollo to o'brien cross over to opposite lady right hand and left then figure to miss your list that right now forehand round you lily midshipman set your partner sir then twist her round that do now stop first figure all over at this time i thought i might venture to talk a little with my partner and i ventured a remark to my surprise she answered very sharply i come here for dance sir not for chatter look massa johnson he tap on botic the second figure commenced and i made a sad bungle so i did of the third and fourth and fifth for i never had danced a cotillion when i handed my partner to her place who certainly was the prettiest girl in the room she looked rather contemptuously at me and observed to a neighbour i really pity the gentleman as come from england that no know how to dance know nothing at all until em hab instruction at barbados a country dance was now called for which was more acceptable to all parties as none of mr apollo johnson's pupils were very perfect in their cotillion 
and none of the officers except o'brien knew anything about them o'brien's superior education on this point added to his lieutenant's epaulet and handsome person made him much courted but he took up with miss eurydice after i had left her and remained with her the whole evening thereby exciting the jealousy of mr apollo johnson who it appears was amorous in that direction our party increased every minute all the officers of the garrison and finally as soon as they could get away the governor's aides de camp all dressed in mufti in other words plain clothes the dancing continued until three o'clock in the morning when it was quite a squeeze from the constant arrival of fresh recruits from all the houses in barbados i must say that a few bottles of eau de cologne thrown about the room would have improved the atmosphere by this time the heat was terrible and the mopping of the ladies faces everlasting i would recommend a dignity ball to all stout gentlemen who wish to be reduced a stone or two supper was now announced and having danced the last country dance with miss minerva i of course had the pleasure of handing her into the supper-room it was my fate to sit opposite to a fine turkey and i asked my partner if i should have the pleasure of helping her to a piece of the breast she looked at me very indignantly and said curse your impudence sir i wonder where you learn your manners sir i take a lily turkey bosom if you please talk of breast to a lady sir really quite horrid i made two or three more barbarous mistakes before the supper was finished at last the eating was over and i must say a better supper i never sat down to silence gentlemen and ladies cried mr apollo johnson with the permission of our amiable hostess i will propose a toast gentlemen and ladies you all know and if be so you don't i say there no place in de world like a barbados all de world fight again england but england never fear king george never fear while barbados stands diff badian fight for king george to last drop of him blood never see the day badian run away you all know them french mans at saint lucie give up morn fortuny when he hear the baby volunteer come against him i hope no offence present company but i'm sorry to say english come here too jealous of badians gentlemen and lady barbadian born ab only one fault he really too brave on purpose hell of island of barbados acclamations from all quarters to follow this truly modest speech and the toast was drunk with rapture the ladies were delighted with mr apollo's eloquence and the lead which he took in the company o'brien then rose and addressed the company as follows ladies and gentlemen mr paul has spoken better than the best parrot i ever met with in this country but as he has thought proper to drink the island of barbados i mean to be a little more particular i wish with him all good health to the island but there is a charm without which the island would be a desert that is the society of the lovely girls who now surround us and take our hearts by storm here o'brien put his arm gently round miss eurydice's waist and mr apollo ground his teeth so as to be heard at the furthest end of the room therefore gentlemen with your permission i will propose the health of the badian ladies this speech of o'brien's was declared by the females at least to be infinitely superior to mr apollo johnson's miss eurydice was even more gracious and the other ladies were more envious many other toasts and much more wine was drunk until the male part of the company appeared to be rather riotous mr apollo however had to regain his superiority and after some hems and haws begged permission to give a sentiment gentlemen and ladies i beg then to say here's to the cock who make lub to the hen crow till he hoarse and make lub again the sentiment was received with rapture and after silence was obtained miss betsy austin rose and said unaccustomed as she was to public speaking she must not sit till and not thank the gentleman for his very fine toast and in the name of the ladies she begged leave to propose another sentiment which was here to the hen what never refuses let cock play compliment whenever he chooses if the first toast was received with applause this was with enthusiasm but we received a damper after it was subsided by the lady of the house getting up and saying now gentlemen and ladies me think it right to say dat it time to go home i never allow people get drunk or kick up bobbery in my house so now i think we better take parting glass and very much obliged to you for your company as o'brien said this was a broad hint to be off so we all now took our parting glass in compliance with her request at her own wishes and proceeded to escort our partners on their way home while i was assisting miss minerva to her red crape shawl a storm was brewing in another quarter 
to wit between mr apollo johnson and o'brien o'brien was assiduously attending to miss eurydice whispering what he called soft blarney in her ear when mr apollo who was above spirit boiling heat with jealousy came up and told miss eurydice that he would have the honour of escorting her home ye may save yourself the trouble ye dingy gut scraper replied o'brien the lady is under my protection so take your ugly black face out of the way or i'll show you how i treat a baby who is really too brave so help me god matter lieutenant pose you put a finger on me i show you what badian can do apollo then attempted to insert himself between o'brien and his lady upon which o'brien shoved him back with great violence and continued his course towards the door they were in the passage when i came up for hearing o'brien's voice in anger i left miss minerva to shift for herself miss eurydice had now left o'brien's arm at his request and he and mr apollo were standing in the passage o'brien closed to the door which was shut and apollo swaggering up to him o'brien who knew the tender part of a black saluted apollo with a kick on the shins which would have broken my leg massa johnson roared with pain and recoiled two or three paces parting the crowd away behind him the blacks never fight with fists but butt with their heads like rams and with quite as much force when mr apollo had retreated he gave his shin one more rub uttered a loud yell and started at o'brien with his head aimed at o'brien's chest like a battering ram o'brien who was aware of this plan of fighting stepped dexterously to one side and allowed mr apollo to pass him by which he did with such force that his head went clean through the panel of the door behind o'brien and there he stuck as fast as if in a pillory squealing like a pig for assistance and foaming with rage after some difficulty he was released and presented a very melancholy figure his face was much cut and his superb jabot all in tatters he appeared however to have quite enough of it as he retreated to the supper-room followed by some of his admirers without asking or looking after o'brien but if mr apollo had had enough of it his friends were too indignant to allow us to go off scot-free a large mob was collected in the street vowing vengeance on us for our treatment of their flashman and a row was to be expected miss eurydice had escaped so that o'brien had his hands free come out you hangman thieves come out only wish had rock stones to mash your heads with cried the mob of negroes the officers now sallied out in a body and were saluted with every variety of missile such as rotten oranges cabbage stalks mud and coconut shells we fought our way manfully but as we neared the beach the mob increased to hundreds and at last we could proceed no further being completely jammed up by the niggers upon whose heads we could make no more impression than upon blocks of marble we must draw our swords observed an officer no no replied o'brien that will not do if once we shed blood they will never let us get on board with our lives the boat's crew by this time must be aware that there is a row o'brien was right he had hardly spoken before a lane was observed to be made through the crowd in the distance which in two minutes was open to us swinburne appeared in the middle of it followed by the rest of the boat's crew armed with the boat's stretchers which they did not aim at the heads of the blacks but swept them like scythes against their shins this they continued to do right and left of us as we walked through and went down to the boats the seamen closing up the rear with their stretchers with which they ever and anon made a sweep at the black fellows if they approached too near it was now broad daylight and in a few minutes we were again safely on board the frigate thus ended the first and last dignity ball that i attended end of chapter thirty one chapter thirty two of peter simple this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m p in washington state peter simple by frederick marriott chapter thirty two i am claimed by captain kearney as a relation trial of skill between first lieutenant and captain with a longbow the shark the pug dog and the will a quarter-deck picture as the admiral was not one who would permit the ships under his command to lie idle in port in a very few days after the dignity ball which i have described all the squadron sailed on their various destinations i was not sorry to leave the bay for one soon becomes tired of profusion and i cared nothing for either oranges bananas or shaddocks nor even for the good dinners and claret at the tables of the army mess and the gentlemen of the island the sea breeze soon became more precious to us than anything else and if we could have bathed without fear of a shark 
we should have equally appreciated that most refreshing of all luxuries under the torrid zone it was therefore with pleasure that we received the information that we were to sail the next day to cruise off the french island of martinique captain kearney had been so much on shore that we saw but little of him and the ship was entirely under the control of the first lieutenant of whom i have hitherto not spoken he was a very short pock-marked man with red hair and whiskers a good sailor and not a bad officer that is he was a practical sailor and could show any foremast man his duty in any department and this seamen very much appreciate as it is not very common but i never yet knew an officer who prided himself upon his practical knowledge who was at the same time a good navigator and too often by assuming the jack tar they lower the respect due to them and become coarse and vulgar in their manners and language this was the case with mr Phillott, who prided himself upon his slang and who was at one time hail fellow well met with the seamen talking to them and being answered as familiarly as if they were equals and at another knocking the very same men down with a handspike if he were displeased he was not bad-tempered but very hasty and his language to the officers was occasionally very incorrect to the midshipmen invariably so however on the whole he was not disliked although he was certainly not respected as a first lieutenant should have been it is but fair to say that he was the same to his superiors as he was to his inferiors and the bluntness with which he used to contradict and assert his disbelief of captain kearney's narratives often produced a coolness between them for some days the day after we sailed from carlisle bay i was asked to dine in the cabin the dinner was served upon plated dishes which looked very grand but there was not much in them this plate observed the captain was presented to me by some merchants for my exertions in saving their property from the danes when i was cruising off heligoland why that lion steward of yours told me that you bought it at portsmouth replied the first lieutenant i asked him in the galley this morning how came you to assert such a confounded falsehood sir said the captain to the man who stood behind his chair i only said that i thought so replied the steward why didn't you say the bill had been sent in through you seven or eight times and that the captain had paid it with a flowing sheet did you dare say that sir interrogated the captain very angrily mr Phillip mistook me sir replied the steward he was so busy damning the sweepers that he did not hear me right i said the midshipmen had paid their crockery bill with a fore topsail ay ay replied the captain that's much more likely well mr steward replied mr Phillip, i'll be damned if you aren't as big a liar as your master he was going to plump out but fortunately the first lieutenant checked himself and added as your father was before you the captain changed the conversation by asking me whether i would take a slice of ham it's real westphalia mr simple i have them sent me direct by count troninskin an intimate friend of mine who kills his own wild boars in the hartz mountains how the devil do you get them over captain kearney there are ways and means of doing everything mr Phillott, and the first consul is not quite so bad as he is represented the first batch was sent over with a very handsome letter to me written in his own hand which i will show you some of these days i wrote to him in return and sent him two cheshire cheeses by a smuggler and since that they came regularly do you ever eat westphalia ham mr simple yes sir replied i i once partook of one at lord privilege's lord privilege why he's a distant relation of mine a sort of fifth cousin replied captain kearney indeed sir replied i then you must allow me to introduce you to a relation captain kearney said the first lieutenant for mr simple is his grandson is it possible i can only say mr simple that i shall be most happy to show you every attention and am very glad that i have you as one of my officers now although this was all false for captain kearney was not in the remotest manner connected with my family yet having once asserted it he could not retract and the consequence was that i was much the gainer by his falsehood as he treated me very kindly afterwards always calling me cousin the first lieutenant smiled and gave me a wink when the captain had finished his speech to me as much to say you're in luck and then the conversation changed captain kearney certainly dealt in the marvellous to admiration and really told his stories with such earnestness that i actually believed that he thought he was telling the truth never was there such an instance of confirmed habit telling a story of a cutting out expedition he said the french captain would have fallen by my hand but just as i levelled my musket a ball came and cut off the cock of the lock as clean as if it was done with a knife a very remarkable instance observed he not equal to what occurred in a ship i was in replied the first lieutenant when the second lieutenant was grazed by a grape-shot which cut off one of his whiskers 
and turning round his head to ascertain what was the matter another grape shot came and took off the other now that's what i call a close shave yes replied captain kearney very close indeed if it were true but you'll excuse me mr Phillott, to sometimes tell strange stories i do not mind it myself but the example is not good to my young relation here mr simple captain kearney replied the first lieutenant laughing very immoderately do you know what the pot called the kettle no sir i do not retorted the captain with offended dignity mr simple will you take a glass of wine i thought that this little brouillere would have checked the captain it did so but only for a few minutes when he again commenced the first lieutenant observed that it would be necessary to let water into the ship every morning and pump it out to avoid the smell of the bilge water there are worse smells than bilge water replied the captain what do you think of a whole ship's company being nearly poisoned with otto of roses yet that occurred to me when in the mediterranean i was off smyrna cruising for a french ship that was to sail to france with a pasha on board as an ambassador i knew she would be a good prize and was looking sharp out when one morning we discovered her on the lee bow we made all sail but she walked away from us bearing away gradually till we were both before the wind and at night we lost sight of her as i knew that she was bound to marseilles i made all sail to fall in with her again the wind was light and variable but five days afterwards as i lay in my cot just before daylight i smelt a very strong smell blowing in at the weather port and coming down the skylight which was open and after sniffing at it two or three times i knew it to be otto of roses i sent for the officer of the watch and asked him if there were anything in sight he replied that there was not and i ordered him to sweep the horizon with his glass and look well out to windward as the wind freshened the smell became more powerful i ordered him to get the royal yards across and all ready to make sail for i knew that the turk must be near us at daylight there he was just three miles ahead in the wind's eye but although he beat us going free he was no match for us on a wind and before noon we had possession of him and all his harem by the by i could tell you a good story about the ladies she was a very valuable prize and among other things she had a puncheon of otto of roses on board Whew! cried the first lieutenant what a whole puncheon yes replied the captain a turkish puncheon not quite so large perhaps as ours on board their weights and measures are different i took out most of the valuables into the brig i commanded about twenty thousand sequins carpets and among the rest this cask of otto of roses which we had smelt three miles off we had it safe on board when the mate of the hold not slinging it properly it fell into the spirit room with a run and was stove to pieces never was such a scene my first lieutenant and several men on deck fainted and the men in the hold were brought up lifeless it was some time before they were recovered we let the water into the brig and pumped it out but nothing would take away the smell which was so overpowering that before i could get to malta i had forty men on the sick list when i arrived there i turned the mate out of the service for his carelessness it was not until after having smoked the brig and finding that of little use after having sunk her for three weeks that the smell was at all bearable but even then it could never be eradicated and the admiral sent the brig home and she was sold out of the service they could do nothing with her at the dockyards she was broken up and bought by the people at brighton and tunbridge wells who used her timbers for turning fancy articles which smelling as they did so strongly of otto of roses proved very profitable were you ever at brighton mr simple never sir just at this moment the officer of the watch came down to say that there was a very large shark under the counter and wished to know if the captain had any objection to the officers attempting to catch it by no means replied captain kearney i hate sharks as i do the devil i nearly lost fourteen thousand pounds by one when i was in the mediterranean may i inquire how captain kearney said the first lieutenant with a demure face oh, i am very anxious to know why the story is simply this replied the captain i had an old relation at malta whom i found out by accident an old maid of sixty who had lived all her life on the island it was by mere accident that i knew of her existence i was walking upon strada real when i saw a large baboon that was kept there who had a little fat pug-dog by the tail which he was pulling away with him while an old lady was screaming out for help for whenever she ran to assist her dog the baboon made at her as if he would have ravished her and caught her by the petticoats with one hand while he had the pug-dog fast by the other i owed that brute a spite for having attacked me one night when i passed him and perceiving what was going on i drew my sword and gave mr jacko such a clip as sent him away howling and bleeding like a pig 
leaving me in possession of the little pug, which I took up and handed to his mistress. The old lady trembled very much and begged me to see her safe home. She had a very fine house, and after she was seated on the sofa, thanked me very much for my gallant assistance, as she termed it, and told me her name was Kearney. Upon this I very soon proved my relationship with her, at which she was much delighted, requesting me to consider her house as my home. I was for two years afterwards on that station, and played my cards very well. The old lady gave me a hint that I should be her heir, as she had no other relations that she knew anything of. At last I was ordered home, and not wishing to leave her, I begged her to accompany me, offering her my cabin. She was taken very ill a fortnight before we sailed, and made a will, leaving me her sole heir. But she recovered, and got as fat as ever. Mr. Simple, the wine stands with you. I doubt if Lord Privilege gave you better claret than there is in that bottle. I imported it myself ten years ago, when I commanded the coquette. Very odd, observed the first lieutenant. We bought some at Barbados, with the same mark on the bottles and cork. That may be, replied the captain. Old established houses all keep up the same marks. But I doubt if your wine can be compared to this. You have never tasted older wine, I think, Mr. Fillet. I beg your pardon, sir, but I can prove to you that I have. For when Noah paid off the ark, my ancestor bought his sea stock, and it's been handed down to my father. There may be three dozen left. Really, Mr. Fillet, you are almost too facetious. Will you take some macaroni? It is one of the best things we can have at sea. I wish you had seen my kitchen at Walcott Abbey. I have no doubt, but it was excellent, replied Mr. Fillet. But I should have preferred eating what came from it. I wish that I had a knowledge of the art which a friend of mine has, a new science, I may say. Pray, what may that be? They call it fumography. Fumography? Never heard of it. It is the art of knowing precisely, by examination of the smoke which comes out of the chimney, what your neighbor has for dinner. Upon my soul, if one could send an excuse at a late hour, that might be useful. My friend is quite an adept. He can tell first and second course entremet, and even if the different articles to be put on the table are done to a turn or not. Now, Mr. Simple, what do you think of that? inquired the captain. I think, sir, that it's all smoke. Ah, bravo, Mr. Simple. You've said a very good thing. I thought so, too but as I wasn't quite sure, I would not laugh till all the rest of the company did. As Mr. Fillet wished to hear the end of the captain's story, he would not contradict him about the wine, by stating what he knew to be the case, that the captain had sent it on board at Barbados. And the captain proceeded. Well, I gave up my cabin to the old lady, and hung up my cot in the gun-room during the passage home. We were becalmed abreast of Coeta for two days. The old lady was very particular about her pug-dog, and I superintended the washing of the little brute twice a week. But at last I was tired of it, and gave him to my coxswain to bathe. My coxswain, who was a lazy fellow, without my knowledge, used to put the little beast into the bite of a rope, and tow him overboard for a minute or so. It was during this calm that he had him overboard in this way, when a confounded shark rose from under the counter and took in the pug-dog at one mouthful. The coxswain reported the loss as a thing of no consequence, but I knew better, and put the fellow in irons. I then went down and broke the melancholy fact to Miss Kearney, stating that I had put the man in irons and would flog him well. The old lady broke out into a most violent passion at the intelligence, declared that it was my fault, that I was jealous of the dog, and had done it on purpose. The more I protested, the more she raved, and at last I was obliged to go off deck to avoid her abuse and keep my temper. I had not been on deck five minutes before she came up, that is, was shoved up, for she was so heavy that she could not get up without assistance. You know how elephants in India push the cannon through a morass with their heads from behind? Well, my steward used to shove her up the companion ladder just in the same way, and with his head completely buried in her petticoats. As soon as she was up, she used to pull his head out, looking as red and hot as a fresh-boiled lobster. Well, up she came, with her will in her hand, and looking at me very fiercely, she said, since the shark has taken my dear dog, he may have my will also. And throwing it overboard, she plunged down on the carronade slide. It's very well, madame, said I, but you'll be cool by and by, and then you'll make another will. I swear by all the hopes that I have of going to heaven that I never will, replied she. Yes, she will, madame, replied I. Never, so help me God. Captain Curdie, my money may now go to my next heir, and that, you know, will not be you. Now, as I knew very well that the old lady was very positive, and as good as her word, my object was to recover the will, which was floating about fifty yards astern, without her knowledge. I thought a moment, and then I called the boatswain's mate to pipe all hands to bathe, 
"'You'll excuse me, Miss Kearney,' said I, "'but the men are going to bathe, and I do not think you would like to see them all naked. If you would, you can stay on deck.' She looked daggers at me, and, rising from the carronade slide, hobbled to the ladder, saying that the insult was another proof of how little I deserved any kindness from her. As soon as she was below, the quarter-boats were lowered down, and I went in one of them and picked up the will, which still floated. Briggs, having no stern windows, of course she could not see my manoeuvre, but thought that the will was lost for ever. We had very bad weather after that, owing to which, with the loss of her favourite pug and constant quarrelling with me, for I did all I could to annoy her afterwards, she fell ill, and was buried a fortnight after she was landed at Plymouth. The old lady kept her word. She never made another will. I proved the one I had recovered at Doctor's Commons, and touched the whole of her money. As neither the first lieutenant nor I could prove whether the story was true or not, of course we expressed our congratulations at his good fortune, and soon afterwards left the cabin to report the marvellous story to our messmates. I went on deck. I found that the shark had just been hooked and was being hauled on board. Mr. Fullett had also come on deck. The officers were all eager about the shark. We were looking over the side, calling to each other and giving directions to the men. Now, although certainly there was a want of decorum on the quarter-deck, still the captain having given permission, it was to be excused. But Mr. Phillip thought otherwise, and commenced in his usual style, beginning with the marine officer. "'Mr. Wesley, I'll trouble you not to be getting upon the hacks. You'll get off directly, sir. If one of your fellows were to do so, I'd stop his grog for a month. And I don't see why you are to set a bad example. You've been too long in barracks, sir, by half. Who is that?' Mr. Williams and Mr. Moore, both on the hammocks, too. Up to the foretopmast head, both of you, directly. Mr. Thomas, up to the main. And I say, you youngsters, stealing off, perch yourself upon the spanker boom, and let me know when you've rowed to London. By God, the service is going to hell. I don't know what officers are made of nowadays. I'll marry some of you young gentlemen to the gunner's daughter before long. Quarter-deck's no better than a bear garden. No wonder, when lieutenants set the example." This latter remark could only be applied to O'Brien, who stood in the quarter-boat giving directions, before the tirade of Mr. Phillips stopped the amusement of the party. O'Brien immediately stepped out of the boat, and going up to Mr. Phillip, touched his hat and said, "'Mr. Phillip, we had the captain's permission to catch the shark, and a shark is not to be got on board by walking up and down on the quarter-deck. As regards myself, as long as the captain is on board, I hold myself responsible to him alone for my conduct.' and if you think I have done wrong, forward your complaint. But if you pretend to use such language to me as you have to the others, I shall hold you responsible. I am here, sir, as an officer and a gentleman, and will be treated as such, and allow me to observe that I consider the quarter-deck more disgraced by foul and ungentlemanly language than I do by an officer accidentally standing upon the hammocks. However, as you have thought proper to interfere, you may now get the shark on board yourself." Mr. Phillip turned very red, for he never had come in contact in this way with O'Brien. All the other officers had submitted quietly to his unpleasant manner of speaking to them. "'Very well, Mr. O'Brien, I shall hold you answerable for this language,' replied he, "'and shall most certainly report your conduct to the captain. "'I will save you the trouble. Captain Kearney is now coming up, and I will report it to myself.' This O'Brien did, upon the captain's putting his foot on the quarter-deck. "'Well,' observed the captain to Mr. Phillip, "'what is it you complain of?' "'Mr. O'Brien's language, sir. "'Am I to be addressed on the quarter-deck in that manner?' "'I really must say, Mr. Phillip," replied Captain Kearney, "'that I do not perceive anything in what Mr. O'Brien said, "'but what is correct. "'And I command here, "'and if an officer so nearly equal in rank to yourself has committed himself, "'you are not to take the law into your own hands. "'The fact is, Mr. Phillip, "'your language is not quite so correct as I could wish it.' I overheard every word that passed, and I consider that you have treated your superior officer with disrespect, that is, me. I gave permission that the shark should be caught, and with that permission I consequently allowed those little deviations from the discipline of the service which must inevitably take place. Yet you have thought proper to interfere with my permission, which is tantamount to an order, and have made use of harsh language, and punished the young gentleman for obeying my injunctions. You will oblige me, sir, by calling them all down, and in restraining your petulance for the future. I will always support your authority when you are correct, but I regret that, in this instance, you have necessitated me to weaken it. This was a most severe check to Mr. Phillip, who immediately went below, after hailing the mastheads and calling down the midshipmen. As soon as he was gone, we were all on the hammocks again, 
the shark was hauled forward hoisted on board and every frying pan in the ship was in requisition we were all much pleased with captain kearney's conduct on this occasion and as o'brien observed to me he really is a good fellow and a clever officer what a thousand pities it is that he is such a confounded liar i must do mr phillott the justice to say that he bore no malice on this occasion but treated us as before which is saying a great deal in his favour when it is considered what power a first lieutenant has of annoying and punishing his inferiors End of chapter thirty two